Hi, everybody. I'm Matthew Pose with Audioholics. I'm here with Don Dunn. You ready, What's Don? What's up, everybody? I'm glad to be here. Awesome. So we're doing our Don and Matt show. I think that's what we've been calling it, or Don and Matt audio show, or road show. I don't know what we're calling ourselves. It's the Don and Matt something show, where we are going to be- To attract. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be discussing today micro LED displays. So now we're doing this because you and I actually have been, I think, doing a bit of research on this topic. Mm -hmm. now, I think we know. I know we have been. Um, and it's something that's uh, of interest to us in part because it's so different, right? It's the, the sound challenges that you face with these new displays are, are really different. And I don't know, five, 10 years ago, this wasn't even on my radar. Like I wasn't even thinking about how to well, get the, good sound with something like that. I mean, the technology hadn't matured enough at that point. I mean, it's it's very popular in, in commercial applications. Um, it's very popular in Hollywood, evidently. Instead of green screens, now they're using these micro LED displays because the, the resolution's so good. Um, but you, as we were working on it, we're, we're trying to uh, win a project that, that uses a very large micro LED display. There's a lot of acoustic challenges to it where you know we need to overcome that. And I think a lot of people that I've talked to, their their knee jerk reaction is, well, why don't you just treat it like a big TV, basically? I mean, it is like a big TV in a lot of ways. It's like a real big TV. A real big TV. Yeah. So they're like, why don't you just put like a left and a right speaker, you know, on either side and you put a center channel underneath it and you're good to go, right? But as you know, that actually doesn't work that well when the display gets to be this big because yeah. the essentially the acoustic centers of those speakers are way off from each other. So you get this Correct. big smiley face or you can do the opposite get a big frowny face put the center channel up above <laughs> and uh and so it, it messes up the sound stage quite a bit when you do that mm -hmm. so the pans are not even you want the pans to be like right across the screen and that's right. what makes the immersiveness seem realistic you know you mm -hmm. want everything tied to the voices so uh you know it takes some work to get it right and there's actually a lot of companies doing research into developing systems for this people have heard about the samsung jbl partnership uh, developing the Samsung Onyx system. So we're going to talk a little bit about that one and how it works. Now, there's another system that I like from Meyer Sound, um, and that's a, a reflex sound system that actually reflects off the screen as well. It does it differently, though. It's a fundamentally different approach. And then there's a system that Trinov has helped to pioneer that basically just uses dual speakers. Right. And, and also, uh, I've been told that James Loudspeakers, also, which is an amazing company, is, are they're also working on a solution for this as well. Yeah, and, and I should say there's a number of companies, Purcell is another one that has developed speakers right. specifically for micro LED displays, but mm -hmm. haven't necessarily done quite the same amount of work to make it seem like it's coming from the screen. So um, I don't want to speak too much for Purcell. I don't know a lot about their approach other than that I know they have a speaker that's designed to go above the screen. So we have a little presentation that I put together. Anyone who watches anytime I come on this channel, you know I've always got slides. Good. Let me get that loaded. People like slides. <laughs> yes. So most of these, yeah, most of these are um, bouncy house or reflective, um, bouncing the sound off of the screen and and back into the audience, which presents some challenges, especially in the uh, residential market because it's very very time consuming to get those delays and and whatnot set up. All right, let me see. Is it working yet? Let me know if you can see this correctly. I see it's just small, tiny, it's a skosh. Is it not big yet? <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> no, it's yeah. not big yet. All right, I'm going to undo what I did then. I am the hillbilly of this duo, by the way. So, you know. Sorry about that, guys. I'm not Gene. I haven't quite mastered the system yet. Share screen. Well, his wife taught him, so. His wife taught him? Yeah, Berta, she pretty much is the heart and soul. All right, this should work now, right? Yeah, man. Cool. All right, so micro LED home cinemas. The next generation in sound. So as we already mentioned, there's a big problem with getting good sound out of these micro LED displays because you can't just put the speakers above and below. Part of the issue, which you can see, this is a commercial cinema, but homes actually have this problem amplified. You can see that that screen is taking up almost the entire front wall. So in the couple of uh, 
systems where I've seen micro LED displays used or specced, they're typically really large. Uh, I would say 150 inch would be considered a very small micro LED display. They're typically 200 plus very, inches. Very small. Yeah, they're typically 200 plus inches. 250 is not unusual. I think that's the size that was spec for one of the ones that you and I are working on. And the problem is when you look at the front of the room where the speakers would go and then you put that 250 inch screen in it. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, a 250 inch screen is like 10 and a half feet, you know, well, once you start including all the controllers. It, go ahead, 220 diagonal is 16 by nine. So, I mean, if you right. got 10 foot ceilings. It's the whole thing, yeah. Pretty much. And and these systems do have a little bit of, of uh, hardware that has to go either above or below the display. So add that into it, you're beyond a 10 foot ceiling room. So basically the point of all this is once you've built this custom room to hold this giant TV, you're in a situation where there's no room for speakers anymore. So yeah. what do you do? Well, actually, before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about the tech because I think there is some confusion around what it is. Um, and part of that confusion, Don, you, you probably deal with this with clients a lot, is that people come in and when they say, I want an LED TV, they probably don't mean a micro LED don't TV. You, don't they, you mean an LCD TV? Yeah, what they probably actually mean is a, is a uh, TFT LCD screen. And the reason they call it an LED is that there used to be these fluorescent tubes that were used in the back of the uh, LCD TVs as the light source. And then they moved to LEDs and it was better. It was brighter. You could do things like you could have local dimming. And so everybody said, I want that. That's a better system. So they were calling those LEDs, but they really weren't because the actual thing that was making the image was not LEDs. That was just a light source. It's, it's right. an LCD panel. Sure. And so here on the, on the left of the screen here, you can see uh, what that looks like. And you can see that essentially there's a, there's a set of color filters there's the liquid crystal pixels that basically turn on and off under each of those sub pixels that's created by the filters. And that's what gives you the image that you see that then gets backlit with something, usually LEDs. Then you've got OLED. Lots of people have heard about that. It emits light on its own. It doesn't need a backlight of any kind. And so it's got lots of these little sub pixels as well of red, green, and blue. It produces its own light. And then you've got this newer technology called micro LED as you can see, it's actually simpler than even OLED. Mm -hmm. The problem is it's at this point in time, we're not quite at a point where we can produce micro LEDs that have the uh, pixel pitch that's necessary to make, let's say 65 inch ones. And I don't know that that's coming anytime soon. I mean, that's not really what this technology is aiming for right now. This is really still looking at, as we were saying, like 150 inch plus, 150 inch being probably the smallest you're gonna see on up. And uh, this is doing the same thing though. It uses LEDs in red, green, and blue. The difference is there's not a filter anymore. There's actually these LEDs in those colors and they're producing the white light when, you know, when they're all turned on. And so you can see there's this very simple system that can be used to create these displays. And the typical way it's done is modular. Now, now Don, you've seen this. I have a picture of it in one of the later slides, but you've seen this. I mean, it's like Legos, right? You like click it together and you get a TV yeah, out of little, it. Little there's a frame and a, like a, a skeleton in the back. And then these, the, you kind of like Legos, you, you, you put these tiles in because I asked the guy, I'm like, how the hell are we going to get that in a house? And he broke it down and showed me, I'm like, that's really cool. Yeah. And I think they're magnetic, right? They connect their magnets to hold in place. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just popped right in. I mean, it was, it was phenomenal. Um, blew me away when I saw it. To, to and this honest. is the system actually from the same company you saw. And so on the left is one, ver they have many, but this is one of the versions of the modules they sell and what it looks like. And on the right, you can see the guy taking it out and putting okay. it back. Be being sarcastic about how hard it is to put together. I mean, it, it's it's very complex, but very simple at the same time. And and it offers a tremendous amount of flexibility because you can make 235 to 1, 240 to 1. You can make 185 to 1 or 16 by 9. I mean... There's all kinds, or 178 to one, there's all kinds of options on how you can deploy this and, and do it. And, and it really, in my opinion, I love projectors. I feed my family by installing projectors, projectors and projection screens. At some point down the road, this is going to come down in price and we're going to see this as a mainstay option for people. And, and I'll let you explain further what the advantages are over a projector. Yeah, we'll, we'll go into that for sure. And, and I was talking to some other people I know that know something about the topic just to kind of get their take. And one of the reactions one of them had was probably in the 
near term, let's say even next 10 years, we're not going to see this replace projectors. But in it, at this point in time, there is no 150 inch to 250 inch display technology or bigger. There is no 300, 350 inch display technology that has the quality of a projector system for use in a home cinema. And uh, the only exception to that is really these micro LED displays. So right now projectors dominate in that market, especially commercial cinemas. Mm -hmm. But in China, for instance, they already are starting to build, I think they're at least up to half a dozen, if not more. Matthew, Matthew. Listen, the micro LEDs, they're huge in China. They're huge. <laughs> that was my terrible Trump <laughs> invitation. No, but they are. That they're really experimental. It's very popular. Them. Yeah, they, they're they're a little ahead of us, I think. In general, China seems to be a little bit more into the newest tech for uh, cinema. So, like a lot of the big companies that make commercial cinema speakers, processors, displays, tend to put them in big installs. There, it might just be that our infrastructure is older, and so they're you know having to build a lot more for their their population versus we already have a lot, but we are, I, we will be getting micro LED display cinemas in the U S if there isn't already some going, I, I'm not aware of any, but, but I'm sure there will be some going up at some point in the near future. And the reason why we're going to talk about, I mean, they, they have some advantages, but what I, I think this friend that I was talking to was suggesting is that probably there'll be like a co-equal product. There's going to come a point where depending on what it is you're looking for, you'd go one direction or the other. All right, so what are the amazing capabilities? Well, technically, in theory, they have the ability to have infinite contrast because they are self-emitting, so they, they emit light on their own. Now, in practice, they don't. The ones that I was looking at for this tend to be closer to 20,000 to 40,000 to one contrast, but basically, compared to projector systems, they can do that even in uh, situations where you're not fully light controlled, which makes them really advantageous. Uh, they are capable of the full DCI-P3 coverage and beyond, uh, and they achieve that natively. It's, it's not based on filters. It's based on the color LEDs themselves. So they're able to reproduce colors uh, much better than projectors typically can. Projectors are getting a lot better with laser-based light sources and really good uh, filters, but at the end of the day, those filters tend to reduce the brightness. And so one of the things you'll see is that projectors, even the best of them are typically only a hundred to the, the most I could come up with was 137 nits on a 150 inch screen, which is probably on the big side. Isn't that what Gene's is? Gene has 150 inch yeah, screen. He does residential. I know that there are commercial projectors that are Incredibly I asked capable. about it actually. They're, they're very bright, but the screens are much larger. So it's about the same. They're about 105 nits, I guess, is the standard using the Christie projector. That was, at least that's what I was told. I'm not an expert right, in that, right. but that's what right. I was told. Yeah, and you're accurate on that. So yeah. that's why they all have uh, special processing to deal with HDR. Yeah, well, that's part of the issue. So micro LEDs can do actually a thousand nits today, and that number is rising. Um, so, you know, you're already at a much higher. Uh, brightness level, and that allows the specular highlights to be reproduced more accurately. Um, and so, yeah, there's a need to be able to um, modify the video signal that's being sent to the projector in order to uh, deal with the more limited dynamic range that, that, that the projector has compared to these displays. So that's a bit of an issue, and it's getting better. You know, they're getting better at, at doing tone uh, remapping that, that fixes some of this, but it's not perfect. Well, we have to be careful not to upset people who romanticize projection screens. <laughs> I've already got a little heat on that because when I saw my first large scale micro LED, it blew me away. I mean, the picture quality, it literally looked like a 220 inch television, which was amazing. You know, it, projectors are not going to go away. There's no doubt. You can't drop a micro LED from a, from a ceiling or whatnot or... But I mean, they are going to be a dominant presence in a few years. I believe that with all my heart. I definitely think that for people who are trying to most accurately reproduce HDR, that may be necessary. Now, one of the things I pointed out here, but I, I want to give the counterbalance to it, is that the HDR spec is actually um, 10,000 nits. That's kind of like the level that we're moving right. towards. That's what Dolby for Dolby Vision set the upper limit at. And I believe the others have followed suit. Now, when I mentioned this to my friend Chris Seymour, his comment was, well, you know, I don't think Dolby's actually correct in their um, argument for how much uh, uh, contrast the human eye is capable of hearing. Uh, hearing. <laughs> See, that's my, my right. seeing. Yeah, right. And so he was arguing that 10,000 nits is way high, that you really don't need that to achieve um, accurate looking images. So that, that number may not be where we need to go, but again, 
we're currently at like 100 nits. And most of you at home with projectors are probably less than 100 nits because that's actually on the bright side of things. Right. That 450 nits that I mentioned, that's if you take the commercial Christie Cinema projector and stick it in your home on a 150 inch screen. That's not what you get in right. the commercial cinema. You're and so, right. yeah. yeah, so if you, if you actually are expecting to achieve 10,000 nits on some sort of cinema display, that's not happening with projectors. I don't think any time in the next 10 plus years, but with these uh, micro LEDs, that's very likely we'll probably be seeing those numbers in the next five years. So brightness. All right, now what about sound though? Sound is a big problem. So these are, I took this from a JBL presentation, so I wanna give them credit since I did take it from them. But in the presentation, they, they developed a solution to this problem because Samsung bought Harman. Samsung has a giant uh, commercial cinema display that they've produced and they needed some help getting the sound right. So the ideal speaker location you can see is actually in front of the screen. Uh, the problem of course is you can't see the screen anymore if you do that, but the reason why that's ideal is that you can't put a speaker behind a screen and get perfect sound. We covered that before. There's no such thing as an absolutely perfect screen. They have gotten way better and the best woven screens do provide very little degradation of sound. But if we're gonna talk about the ideals, the ideal would be three speakers in front of the screen, not behind it. So the best we can do is using a really good acoustically transparent projection screen and you put the speaker behind it. That is the state of the art. That's what's done in all commercial cinemas and that's what's done in the best home theaters. But micro LEDs are solid. You can't perforate them, so you can't put speakers behind them. And then you've got the problem of having to put the speakers above, which is typically what's done with these micro LED displays. And you can see the issue here. So our, you know, to get into psychoacoustics a little bit, the way that we sense elevation, basically how high up and down the sound source is, is related to a couple of, of functions within the ear. But for static sound sources, it's basically related to some filters that are in the ear system that change as the object moves up. And so uh, objects that are up really high will have a different timbre to them as a result of these fi uh, filters. So our ear will perceive that. Now the visual cue is a big part of it too. So uh, the tr uh, ben, uh, um, if you see something basically above the screen, like speakers up there, you're gonna perceive it up there. But if you see like a face on a screen and the mouth is moving, you're gonna perceive it on the screen to a point. It's not perfect. And of course, if you close your eyes, it's gonna go up. Or if you move your head around, it could also kind of move it around. Whoa. So putting a speaker above the screen actually works a little bit on its own, but it's not perfect. It's got some problems and we really don't want that. We want to move the image down. You were going to say something down. Sorry. Yeah. We we've been doing in ceiling LCRs, the angle for 15 years and most people think it's fine. Now I'm not a huge fan of it and I try to avoid it at all costs, but there's certain situations where you have to do that. And Many of my clients are like, this sounds amazing. So you got to take that into consideration tool. Not everybody is an audiophile. Well, and, and to be completely honest, um, we're lousy at detecting elevation. So if you take the visual cues out of it and the object isn't moving, um, we're not very good at locating where it is. If you actually bandwidth limit it to below around seven kilohertz or so, we just can't tell where it is anymore. I mean, if you have a bandwidth limited source that isn't moving, that's above our head and your eyes are closed, you can't see it, you're very likely not gonna be able to tell that it's above your head. If it's way directly above your head maybe, but like if it's just elevated like above a screen, you're not gonna be able to tell. And this this concept, which is related to our, our HRTF, because those filters I was talking about, those are unique to each person's hearing. That's exactly what JBL did. So the funny thing about this is that we at Audioholics have been talking about bouncy speakers for a long time. You guys know we love bouncy house speakers, right, Don? I mean, we install them as much as we can. No. <laughs> but the concept, the bouncy house concept, reflection, might actually be a, a key solution that could help us to get good sound here. And that's what JBL has done, Meyer Sound, a few others. So reflecting sound off the screen combined with special processing may be exactly what's required to perceptually shift the sound down to the screen level the way we want it to be. Now, Gene in 2018 had written a whole thing about uh, these bouncy house speakers and he said, you know, short answer on whether they work or not is yes, Atmos add-on modules work and they are a viable and convenient though compromised alternative to mounting discrete ceiling speakers. In other words, if you can't put holes in your ceiling and put speakers up there, reflecting with the right speakers off of the ceiling 
does work okay. And actually, I've experienced it a few times in very ideal situations where the ceiling height was very high, the elevation speakers were actually above ear level but pointed at the ceiling, and they were very directional. And it was spooky how good it, uh, of a job it did. Um, on the other hand, I've got right here one of those Vizio sound bars that they had sent me a while back with the ceiling reflection speakers, and it hardly works at all. And most of the uh, the kind of cheaper stuff that I've experienced doesn't really work. And Don, I'm sure you've not had the best of experiences. Yeah, either. well, here's the deal. I mean, you can't take a $800 receiver and put the bouncy house speakers on a tower with no delays. I mean, it's just too hard and too complicated to do it. Now, if you have Trenov or high-end processing level products commercially, then you can adjust and, and professional calibrators. But for the general public, just to stick some speakers on top of your towers or have them built in, is this not going to give the desired effect? And I've experienced it. I've played it. I've tried it and heard that it's a nine day difference. However, that might not be the case in a commercial environment where you have high end processing. You can measure, you can do the proper delays. You can really test it and see what's going on, but you're just not going to get that for most consumers. Well, and one of the reasons why the bouncy house speakers typically don't work is that in order for the concept to work, you have to hear first mm -hmm. the sound that's being reflected. So you, the first sound you have to hear is the sound coming off the ceiling. But the distance between you and that speaker is shorter than the distance between you and the, and the ceiling typically, uh, given that the sound has to travel from that speaker to the ceiling and then to you. So in that particular example, if the speaker doesn't control its dispersion such that none of the sound that's being radiated from that upper module hits you, then you're going to hear that first before you hear the reflection off the ceiling. And as a result of that, you're going to not be totally convinced by it. That's true here too. So how does this other technology work? Well, you point the speakers at the screen, it reflects off of the screen. Uh, that reflection comes back at you as if it's a sound source. It's basically like a mirror. So imagine taking a flashlight, pointing it at a mirror, and then you can see that beam. I'm, I'm sure as a kid, Don, you probably did this, right? You took a flashlight, you pointed it in a mirror, and then you looked at how it shined on the wall, and it was like as if you were pointing it at the wall the other way, right? Of course. Of course. It's kind of cool how it works. Sound actually does the exact same thing. It even beams in much the same way as a light does. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you're doing here. But here's the difference. So the, a normal speaker could be best described as if you were to take, I don't know, did you ever have like a mag light? when you were younger where you could take the top off and then it was just an exposed bulb and you could turn it on and the light was just kind of everywhere, right? Everywhere, correct. Yeah. There was no, no dispersion on it, right? I think the one I had, you could put the, the lens on the bottom and use it like almost like a can't, like an electric candlestick. Mm -hmm. So that light goes everywhere. That's how a normal speaker works. It radiates sound over about close to 120 to 180 degrees. Mm -hmm. And so it's spread out very, very wide. If you were to mount that up in the ceiling, like you see in the Meyer sound example here, that's the one on the left, you would hear that. And so it wouldn't really convince you. But if you put that lens back on the mag light and yeah, you focus, aim it, you yeah. can focus that light into a beam, mm -hmm. you don't see the light coming out of the uh, flashlight, you see the light hitting the object and reflecting back at you. And that's what's going on with the Meyer sound approach. The sound is so focused that you're not hearing anything coming from those speakers that are above you. You're hearing the sound that's reflecting off. So it's the precedent effect basically being used here. But and, it's not so simple, but there's time delays and... and, and yeah, it, there's work that needs to be done. Right, right. So there's a pressure wave as well that's produced and that helps us to kind of tell where sound is coming from because we feel it. So you can't reflect from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz off the screen and expect that to be as convincing as if the speakers were actually there. So in the Meyer sound approach, you've got the speakers up in the ceiling, they're shining down on that, you know, shining in the sense of sound shining down on that screen, but actually at that screen, there are mid-bass modules and subwoofers. Everything's time aligned so that the sound that radiates and hits the screen reflects back at the same time as the bass is, is coming out of those speakers, the pressure wave hits you and you're getting something that is perceived as coming from the screen. Works really well. Now, JBL took a different approach. They've yeah. got three speakers above the screen. Those are shining down on you, but they've darkened the sound as they put it. They've de-elevated them by putting a filter in there that removes a lot of high frequencies above a couple kilohertz or so. And that takes away our ability to perceive the elevation. So you can't tell anymore. And as a result, it sounds like it's coming down lower. Essentially, the uh, screen itself, the, the stuff you see on it are giving you visual cues to the location of sound. 
And then what they do though is, because of course, if you did that and you didn't do anything else to it, it would sound lousy. So you have to find a way to make it sound good again. But if you were to put the high frequencies back, it would re-elevate it. So what JBL did was they came up with a different approach. On the side where the surrounds are mounted is a pair of highly directional horn speakers that only handle sound above a couple of a kilohertz. Um, and those are fired at the screen, reflected back at the listener. And it's, again, everything is delayed just so, so it integrates. Everything is timbre matched and everything is EQ just so that the sound that hits you combines as if it's one sound source and you perceive it as if the speakers are at the level of the screen. So again, it's a system that works pretty convincingly and they do it in such a way that it can work relatively well over a large number of seats. Right, but I, I think that's a little over-engineered for a residential application. Plus, it's, you know. It's not designed for residential. I mean, this is, including well, those course, speakers are huge. Right, but that's what we're talking about is, you know, Matt and I have tried to kind of made it our mission to try to engineer and figure out a way to, to accomplish this realistically in a home theater or home environment, which it presents some challenges for sure. Well, and let's talk about that. So here's one example. Now I, I went and used a monoprice in wall speaker, just it was easy to find and we like monoprice, right? This is not a speaker you would probably ever sure. use for something like this, but uh, in this particular case, this is just a, a basic in wall speaker. And what you've got is uh, one above and one below for the left center and right. Now, just like you guys are familiar, I'm sure with phantom centers. So this is a phantom center done a different way. If you had a left and a right speaker, like we do with any two channel system, you hear a phantom center. So meaning if you put one above and below the screen, you also create a kind of phantom center. And as long as everything is delayed just right and EQ'd in a particular way using uh, typically FIR filters, you can also get rid of most of the comb filtering effects and get a, a pretty good sound out of it. So this is the approach that Trinov likes. Now they don't necessarily always do it this way. You could also do a left and a right speaker and just have, excuse me, dual centers. So I'll show you that approach. That would be something like this. So you, you don't have to do the other one. The reason why you would do this first approach, the one that I showed you here before, oops, I did that wrong, sorry about that. The reason why you would do this one would be if you didn't have enough room on the left and the right. Because remember, the screen is huge and it very well could be taking up all the width you have in the room. So if that's true, you're gonna probably do something like this. Or you could have different elevations in your theater with your platform and your seating as we've experienced. Yeah, actually for coverage purposes, that other one I showed you would be a better approach as well. Mm -hmm. Now this is another one that you can do. This is actually probably the more common one that you would do if you did have the room on the left and right and you only had one elevation or like, basically if you had somewhere between two and three rows of seats, this is probably an approach that would work. The other one would work too. If you have more, like you have a mezzanine, that first one is a better approach. But then there's this idea. Now this is my idea and this is gonna have the same kind of trickiness, if you will, but these are those JBL synthesis instinct speakers, and they've got a very directional horn. Now this speaker in and of itself, as it's designed, probably wouldn't work. So I'm not actually telling you, you should go out and buy these and have your integrator put them in the ceiling aimed at the screen and you're gonna get good sound. You will not. But this is part of what Don was saying we need to figure out. At the end of the day, we need something that works for the average consumer who's gonna do something like this. Now I know calling a micro LED display an average consumer in the same sentence probably is a little bit inappropriate. Obviously, anybody who's doing this has money, but First, currently, yeah, for anybody though who isn't building like a dedicated commercial cinema in their home, they're going to want something where you can hide it. I mean, you saw what that Meyer sound system looked like. There was big speakers on bars hanging down, right? It looked very, very industrial. You ain't putting that in my house. <laughs> yeah, if you're not into that, and that has yeah. no white acceptance factor. So you could imagine though that you could create a custom in-ceiling speaker that's designed to be highly directional. You could bandwidth limit it so that it's operating only above, let's say five, 600 Hertz. And that's what's reflecting off of the screen. Then at the screen level, what you could do is actually put your mid-base modules and your subwoofers right up there with the screen. They don't need to have a clear line of sight to you to work right. And so, you know, you can even do slot loading like THX has done before, lots of different things you could do. And then that would give you the perception of sound coming from the screen. So this is one of the things that we're gonna be playing around with and testing and trying to develop an approach to, to use in systems. And actually, as much as I'm testing this for micro LED, you could do this with any screen as long as it's on a hard uh, surface, like a wall. So the problem though, as I mentioned, is that the residential reflected sound needs work. It's not ready to go. There is no off the shelf system that's been tested. 
Meyer Sound believes that the system that they have can actually be scaled down to residential systems, but the appearance would be unacceptable to most. So you would have to really think about how you're going to integrate that, make it look good. And they say it can be uh, brought down in size. I, I really would like to be convinced before I would be specking that in a client system. JBL system is a pro cinema system. That is not going into somebody's home. Uh, it would have to be a very large home for that to work well. Um, again, it, maybe it can be scaled down and, and work okay. And I won't be shocked if somebody's going to go out and buy those speakers and try to do it themselves. But I don't think that that's the approach to be using in a home yet. But I'd like to try it. You know, I'd like to test the idea out. Um, better options could exist, though, and I think they need to be tested. So I showed you one of my ideas. There's some others that uh, you know we've looked into, and, and we'd like to test all of those and, and get a better sense. So we're actually going to be going in and doing some of that testing. We, we work with somebody who has these displays, and we're going to be actually setting up a test system. My goal would actually be to do some real research. We have people with like a laser pointer, and we put uh, basically sound objects up in sort of virtual space in front of them give them visual cues, no visual cues, and ask them to point and try the different approaches and see which one gives us the most accurate. You know, if we can achieve the same as the traditional LCR at the right height through one of these other approaches or get 90% there, I'd be really happy. I mean, that would be pretty cool. It would be really cool. I mean, and we're in a unique position that we have access to both the manufacturer of the micro LED large scale screens and speaker manufacturers. Um, that we deal with, especially you deal with. So we're we're really optimistic. We can we can kind of come up with a system that can be duplicated and used. Um, this is going to be a thing. It, it sounds crazy, and it kind of is now, unless you're extremely wealthy to do that. But I mean, I was selling sixty inch plasmas in two thousand four for eighteen thousand dollars. Think about that. Yeah, I I remember when they came down to ten thousand dollars, and all of a sudden. Yeah well-to-do but more average people were like, well, hmm, that's an interesting option. Maybe I should look at that. And the reality is $10,000 is a lot of money. I, I sold a ton of Fujitsu's at $18,000 for a 60 inch just by nature of what it was. Yeah, so I, I do have some more slides we'll go through here. So this is a better picture of uh, one of the mixing studios. So Netflix is actually one of the clients for Meyer Sound. And this is probably one of the Netflix mixing uh, studios. And you can see how they've got the whole system set up. And you can see that they've got all of the Atmos surround speakers put in there. They also have the LCRs that are pointed at the screen. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so again, you can see that this is not a system that's going into your average home. So one of the issues with all this is to make this system that you see here work, or the JBL, is that there's a lot of DSP processing that's necessary. Um, otherwise, th the whole thing doesn't work. And the reflection could impact the timbre of the system. So you do have to make sure you can EQ it so it has a nice uh, a frequency response that's nice and smooth and not affected by all that. Time aligning is really important. Uh, you got to make sure you can get that right. Um, you know, your, any average DSP processor can handle that. It's just, you know, making sure you have sufficient channels, you know how to do the measurements to get that right and that you can get that set up right. But there's, you know, some of the tech that's already been developed may not translate into a small room as well. The other thing is speakers. I think we need new speakers. I don't think that, I mean, there's a lot of commercial speakers that could work for this, but residential speakers are way too wide dispersion. And so they're not going to work. And we need, even the ones that use waveguides are typically 90 to 100 degrees uh, half angle, and that's just too wide. So we probably need to have speakers that are more like somewhere between 40 and 60 degrees. Uh, if you look at the polar, I didn't pull it up, but if you look at the polar response of that JBL uh, horn speaker, it's very narrow dispersion. Um, and then I think that there's a need for a little bit of basic research on some of these concepts just to make sure it all works out. So I was mentioning before, typically the way you do research to make sure that the system you're using to recreate sound locations is something that has people point out where they think an object is coming from. So one of the classic studies involved a laser pointer and you create this sort of virtual spot and space where the sound is supposed to come from and somebody has to localize it and they point at it and then you see how accurate they are. They get it right or they don't get it right. And so we need to make sure that, that we understand what types of things play around with that. I mean, the other thing that could affect this is room reflections. It's totally possible that if you don't kill a lot of the reflections in the room and then you do something like this, that it's going to totally screw up sound localization. And so it may be that how you treat a room would change a little bit as well. And these are things we need to figure out. Oh, that was my whole presentation. So let's just go back to you and I. Yeah, so we're about to dive uh, knee deep into this, uh, Matt and I are, and do some testing with some conventional speakers at first, 
several different types, measure and see kind of where it lands and they kind of tailor it from there. I'm thinking some kind of really thin, almost, I hate to use the word sound bar, but very wide speakers with, with multiple drivers, with uh, very focused, um, you know, tweeters or, or output horns on them is going to be the solution to do this. Something that can blanket or go around a screen. Cause you're looking at one right now where it basically there's like a, a total of a foot. So, um, you know, six inches on the top and the bottom right now. Is that, is that correct? Well, I, there are, I'm looking at one right now from another client where that could be true. I, I have to right. find out the exact size of the screen, but one of the projects I'm working on, um, the original spec for the screen was large enough that you could be in a situation where there was only a, a foot total, maybe two feet right. at most. That's not enough room really for any reasonable speakers that have decent output to, to be fitted. Cause you don't want the speaker right on the ground. <laughs> I know? mean, to a point there are companies like Leon um, who we're going to have on, on our show one night, uh, triad, uh, there's different companies making really phenomenal high output sound bars. Why couldn't you take that concept and expand it out? I mean, if you've got a 16 foot wide screen, you can put a lot of drivers in there. You might not be able to have large drivers, but you can have an array of drivers and cross them over properly and get and kind of get that focus. So, I mean, this is uncharted territory. It is. Nobody's done this before because these are so uncommon in residents. And most of the installs that I've seen have typically been of the more basic type. So what I've typically seen in residents when they do put in the micro LED displays is just the most basic of sound. And our goal really is to make sure that that experience that you can get from a really good dedicated home cinema with a perforated screen and speakers behind the screen, you could still get with the micro LED. We just need to figure some of these things out. So there's actually somebody who, who uh, su suggested the same thing. So uh, uh, SI Services here says, uh, oh, nope, this is the wrong one, but it was you who said it. Let me find the one where you said this. Hold on, here we go. We're learning. <laughs> you coming to it twice. Um, he said the wall of sound over at Sound United. So I'm not familiar with exactly what it is that he's talking about, but um, it's the same idea you mentioned of speakers around the screen. So I do think that DSP processing using beam steering and things like that could be a potential option you, where you could be putting them all around. And yeah, I mean, the reality is you could have, let's say, two inch or three inch drivers that have a really good response to them that as long as you have enough of them could actually achieve really high output. I mean, there are some pro right. level three inch drivers that could easily in, in groups of 10 or 20 hit 120 decibels and get you what you need. So there's a couple of uh, products in years past that kind of really give me hope on this. One was a company called Artisan, which I think uh, Savant has purchased. And Artisan used to make speakers that would flank a large uh, plasma or LED, whether it's 65, 75, and they would have the left and right channel and two channels that would sum to make a center with circuitry to do that. That sounded phenomenal, mm -hmm. absolutely phenomenal. And another is going back to when Yamaha first came out with their uh, their first powered sound bars uh, with beaming technology, they actually did a really good job with the DSP and processing of simulating surround. So taking the considerations of these products from years past and quite a few years past that achieved the goal, I think that we can do that quite easily and, and achieve the output that we want to get. I'm not too concerned about it. It's just somebody needs it to bring it together. And I think Matt, you're the guy to do it. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. So, no um, <laughs> so this in uh, this question is will bouncing off the screen affect frequency range? So yes and no. The the real right answer is no, it won't. If you take a speaker and you point it at a wall, and again, all you're hearing is that if you if you measure that reflection, it's actually something that we do sometimes for it's called in situ sound absorption measurement. Is you take a speaker and you have a microphone between the speaker and the wall. Now you've already measured this speaker in the same way, let's say outside or in an anechoic chamber, and then you, you know what the response of the speaker is. So you measure it off the wall. What you can do is remove the speaker's direct sound and only measure that reflection. What you'll see is that off of a wall, just a regular, I'm pointing at a wall that you guys can't see, the, the what is that called, the fourth wall? Uh, off of the normal drywall, it will reflect back with an almost completely unchanged response because drywall for the most part is completely reflective. Mm -hmm. It will be slightly lower in level, especially at lower frequencies, because some of the sound will pass through the drywall. But otherwise, it's not really affected. What happens in reality, though, is that it's not really like a totally flat surface. You know, the screen itself is going to protrude a little bit from the real wall behind it. You're going to have all these little imperfections. The sound will resonate a little bit, like those panels probably are a little bit resonant, things like that. And all of that's going to uh, change it. So then you'd have to EQ it back to normal. 
So here's a good point. Every speaker you've ever owned in your life, you've heard bounced off a wall. In fact, most speakers count on that. <laughs> That's part of, of, of what they are. So, you know, I don't think it's going to affect it. I don't particularly like the idea of the bouncy house just because of the, I know it'll work. It's the setup and the tech, the technology and the professional, you know, calibration and measuring that's involved in it. You're not going to get any Odyssey or Wipeout or Direct that's just going to measure that and take care of it for it, you. That's yeah, it really. Well, a lot of it's speaker design too. Most of them are not designed correctly. But yeah, this individual is asking what it was. For those of you who don't know what we're talking about, that is a, a term that I'm pretty sure Gene invented. I don't. I hadn't actually heard the term. Bouncy before. house. He, Bouncy he house. It. it was a smart yeah. ass Geneism. But, yeah, but there you go. listen, it it manufacturers had to try to find a way because most people aren't going to hire an integrator. They're not going to run wires. They're not going to put speakers on the ceiling because the wife won't let them. Or maybe they don't trust in ceilings. So it, it was it was a band-aid solution to to achieve. Now, in in the right room, because they always show a diagram in an acoustically right room or a, a rectangular room. Yeah, it works okay, but it's just not that good. You're not gonna get that spine tingling chill that Atmos can give you by doing the bouncy house. That's just the truth. And, and no matter well, what a manufacturer says. And a lot of people live in the wrong room. Like there's a lot of people Everybody out does. there. Everybody does. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, but there's some that are really wrong, right? Like, like you and I have a common client whose ceiling is pitched, right? Such. Oh, and yeah. he, he, he sits completely on one side of that pitched yeah. ceiling. Sorry, so, sorry Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so like that, that kind of a room, you could not do the, the bouncy house approach, right? No, you can't reflect sound off of that. Well, there's angles in the ceiling. If you've right, got a gonna, cathedral ceiling or it's just not going to work. I mean, period. Yeah. So you've got a lot of people who have that kind of a situation. You've got other people who are doing it, let's say in like a basement, their ceiling height is like less than eight feet. So you're sitting really close to it. Right. That's going to be a really tricky situation. You really, it's, it works better when there's a decent amount of ceiling height to work with. Uh, it needs to basically be a flat reflective ceiling. So what do you do if you've got like a, an acoustic ceiling, right? Like one of those drop ceilings, it's not going to work off of that very well. No. That's a common no. ceiling though, right? You got anyone with a, a theater basement. I mean, common commercially, not common in homes, but still, well, it's common in basements. Florida. We don't have basements in yeah. Florida. That's why you don't know about these. See where I used to come from in Chicago. That was like everybody's basement. I, I grew up, I grew up up North. I know what basements are, but you're, you're right. You're right. Listen, there's no perfect solution. We, I just don't particularly like that, that kind of product. I think it, it um, over promises and under delivers. Um, to people that think they're getting the full effect of it and no knock on the manufacturers. They're just trying to create a solution to help their clients and at least try to do it. But the marketing departments get a hold of it. I don't think you could take any real speaker engineer manufacturer in the technical side that we know. And they would go, yeah, that works great. You know, I mean, it, it is what it is in the right room. If it's a rectangular room with a 10 or 12 foot ceiling, you're in the right spot. Sure. I mean, reflecting it off, but, to do that correctly takes a lot of calibration, a lot of measuring, a lot the right speaker and the right speaker placement. Yeah. But, you know, going back to what we're really talking about here, you got it. You got to admit, if we can come up with a system that can be mounted 100 percent in the ceiling or 100 percent on the wall and give mm -hmm. people the, the in wall and give people the perception that it's actually coming out of the screen. From an integrator standpoint, that solves a lot of problems for a lot of people who from that, you know, as we call it wife acceptance factor. I got to tell you, I have a lot of clients whose wife acceptance factor is them. You know, like they're they're the ones that the husband, if you will, is the one who doesn't tolerate this stuff. It's not not everybody is into that. You know, mm -hmm. you're cool with four 18 inch subs in your room. I'd be cool with eight 18 inch subs in your room. But I, I have people I've worked with who are like, look, it's a minimalist room. Uh -huh. I don't want to see anything. Uh -huh. you, I mean, listen, here's, here's the, you know, Don Dunn keeping it real part of this. Most people have never heard really good sound. That's just the bottom line. Not really good sound companies like Bose. God bless you, but you don't make really good sound in the home. You make lifestyle products that are cute. They sound good until you compare them to something else. Um, so there's going to be a whole bunch of products that pop up to, to deal with this that claim to be this great and they've got cool diagrams and oh that makes perfect sense just like the in ceiling front speakers but they don't sound that good i mean can what we're trying to do is achieve something for a true audiophile or somebody who really wants something a little bit better i mean th that's our goal and that's the goal of audioholics is to provide the information on the best products that there is that's my goal as a professional integrator to give my clients the best product that there are not a band-aid 
not a, oh, it's good enough, but actually, wow, this makes sense. And really this good sound. Could be, yeah, this can be scaled where you're like, holy shit, man, this is the, the experience that I wanted. The, the video, peop, most people love video. I mean, video is king. Look at video re review sites. They got 2 million followers. Everybody has a TV. Not everybody has a surround system. Most people have a big, big TV and a, and a, and a cheap sound bar from like LG or whatever. And they're like, oh, it's amazing. So we're catering to the people that make that where sound matters. And the people I think that are going to buy uh, 100,000, 50,000, 200,000, quarter million dollar, half million dollar giant micro LED display are going to want a little bit better sound than the average person. At least we're hoping so. So I to that, yeah. I this so TR here has mentioned didn't one of the early Sony crystal displays use exciters behind the micro LED to produce sound? So a couple things. First, it it was not a micro LED. Um, mm -hmm. That that this is that's an LCD TV you're talking about. It had an LED backlight. But yes, one of their early TVs had exciters. Now that is a possibility. I'll tell you why I don't see exciters being the technology that would take over for this. It would solve a lot of problems, but there's one big one. They tend to be very inefficient and they don't tend to be able to play very loud. And because of that, you know, you'd have to figure out a way to basically get the exciters into a left center and right, which can be done. And then you've got to be able to get them to have a, a really good low distortion, frequent, you know, flat frequency response at output levels that are up to 105 decibels in very large rooms. Because remember, we're talking about displays that are going to be at least 150 inches. So Massive. Gene's room, right, Gene's room is the smallest room. You're probably going to be sticking one of these in. And his room and is pretty 20 big. 20 by 25, yeah. Yeah. And so most rooms are probably going to be having, you know, at least one of the dimensions closer to 30 feet, if not more. You're talking about really big rooms, and those exciters just typically aren't capable of producing the kind of output you need in a room that large with low distortion. So I, I don't think that that's going to be the answer, but there may be somebody who plays with it and figures it out. All right, and then we got this uh, Johnny Blaze, <laughs> micro LED versus OLED, or OLED. Uh, is the micro LED set to surpass OLED in terms of overall quality? So everything I've heard from, I'm not really a video expert. You know, what, what we've been talking about here is sound, but what I've heard from experts is that uh, yes, uh, it's so the reasons why I've heard it's better is it's capable of significantly higher brightness. So right mm -hmm. now, none of the uh, OLED TVs are capable of that thousand yeah, plus. They, they struggle so, in bright rooms. Yeah. And then the other thing is that, as I understand it, they're more scalable. So there's some issues with large scale production of the OLED into really big displays and keeping them reliable. Uh, whereas with micro LED, it's, you can make it as big as you want to make it. There's no issues and they, they can get brighter and brighter, higher and higher resolution. All right. So, you know, talking about kind of digressing a little bit and getting the audio, there is so much amazing high-end audio out now. Tons of manufacturers make great speakers. But more importantly, the sources that we listen to with Tidal, Cobuzz, Amazon HD, Apple Lossless, um, it's a renaissance. So everybody that follows this and watches this, Make it your mission to go out and educate people or at least let them hear a high-end system so they go, oh, my God, I didn't know this existed. And the more people that get into it, the more products are going to come down, the more amazing stuff we're going to be able to produce. I mean, it really is a renaissance right now that now that we have for 15 bucks a month, you can have every song ever made known to man in CD quality or much higher in certain cases. I mean, we need to have the products to be able to reproduce this. I think... If once normal people and normal, I mean, I'm abnormal, but once people hear really good audio and not settle for that, you know, Vizio or LG cheap sound bar that they sell at Walmart, and can, that's where it's at. And that's where we're going to see things like micro LEDs not be for super rich people, but for people that work hard and, and are able, able to afford something nice. It, listen, it, I've, I've went through the tube TV, projection TV plasma tv you know led i've i've seen and lived and paid and fed my family through this whole process but it's accelerated and i think it's going to accelerate people are like oh micro leds aren't going to be around but for 10 years that's not true i believe they're going to you're going to be able to buy a 150 inch micro led display for you know 15 grand probably in the next three to five years if not less maybe even less than that given the prices i mean 
I know a 20 inch LEDs are, excuse me, a hundred inch LED is 20 grand right now. Three years from now, you're going to be able to buy that for five grand. I mean, that's just the progression. It's accelerating. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right about that, which is why you and I see this as an important opportunity to, to pay attention to. I think continuing to ignore, we, we've actually uh, taken some heat for suggesting that this is going to surpass or even equal projection. And I, I think the reality is it's naive to think that it's not. Yeah. And I think integrators that fail to uh, basically build some chops around that are going to not be able to put good systems together. But one of the things that we've learned or I guess you knew this, I didn't know this until I started working with more integrators, is that the reality is there's a lot of folks out there that are totally happy to sell you a $200,000 TV and a really lousy a sound bar to go with it. Um, and I think, you know, we, we want to make sure that isn't the world we live in. You know, I, I, know, I know that we can't actually change everybody out there, but it'd be nice to make sure that when somebody is investing that much money into a display that they're getting sound that matches. And I don't think it needs to cost an arm and a leg, and I don't think that it needs to be all that complicated. You know, like I said, there's some figuring out that needs to happen right now, but once that's figured out, I think it actually could be accomplished in, in relatively simple ways. I mean, my personal mission is to, to get people back into good music. I mean, music is the the rhythm of the universe that really is you know you look at quantum mechanics they talk about you know the the flow of it i mean it's just we're, we're we love music and people need to experience that i mean there's it's a renaissance right now bringing this back in and and i just want people to go out and spread the word and let people listen have them over listen to their systems and and that's going to drive this technology for video and audio down to get to get that experience especially in where we live now with COVID and movie theaters are kind of fading away or withering and people are, are, are able to watch new release movies at home. Sorry to digress on that. I'm just passionate about it. I, every night I listen, I end my day, but listen to music, man. It's, it just, it's, you know, this world needs more of that. It really does. Yeah. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, I enjoy watching movies, uh, but my way of relaxing, is listening to music and when totally. i've had a, a tough day or i'm stressed out i don't put on an action movie usually that would do the opposite to me right, right. To, no, to really like relax i you know put on preferably i like speakers so you know but if M i have music to headphones, whatever. fingers of bourbon man or whatever tea or wine or whatever your your poison is no it's 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 a cool time and i'm just super glad to be hooked up with you and audioholics where we have a little bit of a platform where we can talk about this and talk about the reality realities of it you know um this big scale led we need to we need to document it and we need to to put it out there what the research that we're doing so maybe more people can pick up on it um as we as we go along and and maybe show pictures if we're lucky of the projects that we win that have these in them yeah, absolutely. I, I think that'll be great. So, you know, we, we've been going now for almost an hour and I just, you know, okay. if, you, if you've got more you want to talk about, Don, you can. I've kind of run out of, of things to say yeah. about micro LED displays at this point, but I do want to say first, I want to thank uh, Gene for letting us uh, take over his channel for a little bit. We're going to keep bringing you some good stuff. Yeah. Uh, we've got lined up. I hope we don't, you know, there's always a chance that some of our guests will have to get rescheduled. So I don't want to make promises, but the next one we have planned is really cool. Um, really he's cool. an expert in uh, basically spatial sound reproduction. So how you perceive music as being reproduced in the original event or space that it took place. And he, he is, I would call him the leading expert in that topic. So he's going to come on our channel and he's going to talk with us all about it. I really enjoy talking to him. Um, he's he a and I have had, right? he's a professor at Princeton University in New Jersey. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, I think that that's going to be a really cool conversation. He's actually going to probably come on more than once because there's so much to talk about with that topic. But, you know, even with what we're talking about here right now with the micro LED displays, um, it, you know, and having to, to improve sound, all of that is because we want to make it so that when you're watching movies, you're immersed or when you're listening to music, you're immersed in the real event. And so he's going to talk to us more about what it takes to do that and the science behind that. Because to, to be honest, what I've learned over the years, as I've come to understand how that works, is that most of us come into this hobby with a complete misunderstanding of how we perceive sound in space. So I think this is going to be a very cool presentation. I hope you join that. Uh, it's going to be obviously the same time next week. And we are getting that one ready this week. So I don't know. I'm, that's, I'm, that's exci all I I'm excited about that one. I mean, super I am too. excited about that. To do that we're going to have um the ceo of of leon speakers 
who make incredible audio file quality products that disappear into a room. You know, sound bars, uh, in ceiling speakers and wall speakers, anything custom, and talk about how they design their drivers, how they're able to achieve amazing sound with with very small footprint speakers. We're gonna have Kevin Deal on, who's a big YouTube guy who who is probably the biggest seller of tube equipment high-end speakers out there on the market. And, and he's just a trip. He's a no shit, tell it like it is. I enjoy the hell out of the guy, you know, listen to him. He's going to talk about trends and what people are selling. We got some really cool guests lined up. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Everybody stays up late and joins in with us. Yeah. And if we don't have a guest, we're just going to nerd out with you guys for a little while. So that was what happened today. But we, we do have some guests lined up. I think it's going to be pretty cool. I think that's all we got for tonight. So right. until next time. Keep listening. Keep listening.